back to that Rocky Star here. My name is Dan Fay. Um, I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. My call sign is KG5BBY. And I'm going to pre be presenting QMesh, which is something I've been developing. It's a long range, low cost wireless mesh network for digital voice communications. So a quick overview of what QMesh actually is. Um, it's basically another um, MANED or wireless network protocol. Now there's lots of other, well, people have been making lots of other, these low data rate mesh networks. What makes QNet unique is that it's isochronous, which means it should be able to handle streaming data like voice. Most of the other ones are designed around basically just blitting small um, squirts of data akin to APRS. And it's a low, it's relatively low data rate. The fastest you could expect to do is maybe a few tens of kilobits, but that's enough for um, vocoded voice. And yes, it can also do telemetry and other things like that. It is, it uses something that's becoming more popular in kind of the internet of things space, as well as other small devices. And it's using LoRa, which is, it's a proprietary chirp spread spectrum waveform, but it's gaining a lot of wide use. What the main advantage everyone talks about is it provides a better sense, it receives sensitivity than a lot of these standard modulations like FSK, PSK, and so on. It has some interference resistance capabilities. And for QMesh, I'm actually leveraging some of the unique characteristics of the LoRa waveform to make QMesh work. So just background on what MANET's wireless mesh networking is. Basically, a MANET stands for Mobile Ad Hoc Network. Um, they're self-assembling, self-healing, so nodes can jump on, jump off, and the network functions well and doesn't fall over. Mesh networking works where you nodes relay packets until they reach their destination. And there's two types of mesh networking. There's routed and flooded. Routed means each node has some understanding of the path that a packet needs to get, packet needs to travel to get to its destination. Whereas um, flooding just kind of everyone repeats what they hear. QMesh uses a synchronized flooded network. And what this means is that you're retransmitting the packets, which every node does it at the same time. And the advantage here is it provides a fairly structured way of communication that allows, that works well for streaming voice or other kind of streaming like applications. So some background on LoRa. LoRa, again, it, it's, it's an implementation of chirp spread spectrum. Um, it's used in different battery powered internet of things type devices. Um, the most famous protocol used for it is LoRaWAN, which is something Semtech made, but it's also being used in Amazon Sidewalk. So that's a, there's a good chance if you buy some of the higher end echoes, you will see um, a LoRa using device. If you actually open it up, you'll find a LoRa chip in there. And the largest benefit here is that chirp spread spectrum gives you a large processing gain versus FSK or OOK. Um, as you can see here, FSK maybe is minus 123 dBm sensitivity and LoRa gives you like minus 132 dBm. Um, downside of LoRa itself is that the bit rates aren't incredibly fast. Like the fastest on sub six gig, um, sub, sub one gigahertz is about 62 kilobits, which is a lot, which is enough for a lot of stuff, but obviously you're not going to be streaming video over it. Um, so as I calculate it, you can get like a nine dB sensitivity improvement. So here are some LoRa parameters. The main parameters you play with are spreading factor. Basically, spreading factor trades off sensitivity for performance. You can use different bandwidths for your chirp. Since this is spread spectrum, it's fairly wide. So you can have up to half megahertz wide. There are options going all the way down to about 7.8 kilohertz, but there's some caveats in having that work correctly. And there's a coding rate because there's a very simple um, forward error correction in there. Okay, so one of the big things that QMesh does is it leverages the FM capture effect. And this is how it manages to survive the large scale self interference you will deal with when you have lots of retransmissions at the same time. 
So what we can do is the capture effect will allow this to actually work. So one useful thing about LoRa though, is that there's actually some character characteristics of the waveform that help us improve the likelihood capture actually works. So some games you can play as we play as, um, you kind of shift the frequency around on a per packet basis. And that causes basically the chirps to overlap less. And that increases the likelihood of capture. And this is sort of leveraging some features in the LoRa receiver that allow for a large received frequency offset that's used in this case to, for basically so you can use cheap inaccurate crystal oscillators. But in this case, we're using it to randomly wobble the frequency and as a result, kind of reduce the amount they overlap. And you can also do this by adding a timing offset and the um, low symbol rate helps a lot here. So next here, these are some of the techniques we can do. Okay, so here's the, here's a diagram of what's going on. So there are, there's two LoRa signals on two different channels. Obviously they don't overlap. If they're on the exact same frequency, they completely overlap. So there's a good chance they're just gonna destructively interfere completely and you get nothing. Now, if you add a very small offset here, it's more likely they're, they're not gonna overlap and there's enough power different, apparent power difference to improve capture. At a more coarse grained level, we can also change the frequency to cause entire symbols like here to not overlap. And likewise, we can mess with the timing here and cause the symbols to not overlap as much. So all of these things help out improving, dealing with the large self-interference you will see if lots of devices are retransmitting at the same time. So here's a high level TD, TDMA protocol aspect of QMesh that allows multiple nodes to talk to each other and not interfere with each other as they transmit data on multiple sets of nodes. Um, in the name of time, I'm not gonna go into too many details about exactly how the stuff, how these things go along, but this is an illustration of how it works. Another key part of QMesh that is in, that's kind of unique to it versus other um, LoRa based mesh networking is there's a more sophisticated forward error correction code. There's a very simple Hamming based one built into LoRa, but it's not great. So instead I'm using Reed Solomon Viterbi forward error correction to provide more robust error correction that should not only in theory just improve range between two LoRa devices talking to each other, but should also um, allow it to tolerate more of the self-interference. And the results I have later show this, that the better forward error correction is helpful and essential to make this work. So here's some test nodes, basically, it's a one watt LoRa module. Normally they operate at maybe like 100 to 200 something milliwatts. This is a special node, special module that can transmit up to a watt. And it's kind of a quasi Arduino shield that plugs into an STM32 board. And also as a convenience thing, there's a simple OLED display to provide live information that you can get without having to hook up a serial port. So some of the results here are um, in testing the collisions. What I did was I simulate a worst case scenario where there's three nodes transmitting at exactly the same time and their antennas are a quarter wavelength apart and they're transmitting at the same power. I also, I did some other tests with varying the power, but basically in this setup you get with one, two, and three interfering node setups, you can get a 99% packet receive rate if there's forward error correction. Without forward error correction, the packet receive rate drops. One node's 99%, which is what we would expect with no interference. Two nodes drops down to 93, three nodes drops down to 90%. Another thing I noticed is that the interference does raise the noise floor, so the really weak signals don't get across. 
So some next steps here, um, short-term goals I'm currently working on is I'm replacing the kind of JSON-based serial communications interface with a protobuf interface that I'm also trying to make compatible with KISS so that um, networks like, so a lot, of, a lot of APRS using apps can take advantage of it. Um, another thing I'm sort of playing around with is I wanna look at trying to do receive diversity by just having two board and then linking them together over a serial port and using some combining techniques there to improve receive success. Um, on the longer term, the kind of, I guess, productization of this is to develop a bunch of small FM repeaters that take in and out um, FM analog voice and they encode and decode into codec two and use QMesh to inter to link with each other. And I've done some work with this and I can build the little repeaters can should be able to run off of solar power, maybe at most like a 20 um, watt panel and maybe a like 100 watt hour battery. They should, easy, should be easy to stand up a series of linked repeaters. And in theory, since everything's, they have kind of a public interface of um, FM analog, they should be able to even in some cases in a temporary situation, expand the coverage of existing repeaters. And this also means people can just use it with their existing radios. So there's, don't have to worry as much about, people can start using it without having to sweat a lot of industrial design or like physical robustness or compactness issues. So here's a picture of um, the actual nodes, some of the nodes I've been working on. As you can see, there's the board, there's the little LoRa shield. Um, in this case, there's a lithium ferrophosphate battery on there. There's a solar charge controller, solar panel. So this will just run. So this actually, this general setup works pretty well. It's just running in my backyard right now, just kind of sending out test packets. So this is the formal structured part of my presentation here. Here's some contact information if you're interested. So at this point, I'm just gonna um, open up for questions. Because I basically, I blasted through a lot of stuff and I think there's probably stuff that people, specific things people are interested in. Well, I'll, I'll start with a question I always ask. Why is it called QMesh? Um, it was kind of an Albuquerque thing. Um, and a lot of Albuquerque related things are um, named, oops, excuse me, named after um, Q for like Albuquerque. So like there's a big Q sign on top of, um, on, in the Uptown Mall, there's, an organization called, I mean, the make, there's a private maker space here and that's called Q Lab. And there's some civic education organization called Q Works. So I decided to follow in that tradition. So that's where the Q comes from. The mesh is obviously, it's a mesh network. Um, I, I, did I miss what band you're working in? I'm sorry? What band is this in? Um, okay, so the Laura can operate there's a LoRa chipset that'll operate from 150 megahertz to 960 megahertz. There's also a LoRa chipset that'll operate in the 2.4 gigahertz band. This, my tests here were done on 70 centimeters. It's also pretty, it's also pretty easy to get modules that can just be dropped in um, that are used on 915, so the 33 centimeter band. We actually ran some experiments for the Dirty 30 and um, we were running in the 70 centimeter band running mm -hmm. 100 milliwatt um, transmitters and we got like 20 miles out of it. But our data rates of course are way, way, way lower than what you were doing. But we actually discovered the exact same as you did that we had to re-implement the error connect correction because the the built-in error correction in LoRa just sucks. It, yeah, it, it is. And I actually, another sort of back burner project is, um, I think there's a way to extract soft decoding information from the radio. So that would be useful to guide um, improving your kind of receive floor. 
And another thing that would help with if with adding the forward error correction is basically to lower the receive threshold because right now the radio seems to only function, it's basically tuned so that it only receives LoRa packets that it has a high probability it will decode correctly. But as you start using more sophisticated forward error correction, um, that should, you should be able to receive weaker packets successfully. So one kind of interesting thing is I got a Semtech engineer sent me the entire register map for the SX1262 LoRa radio. So, I mean, there's all sorts of fun parameters to tune, but it should, it, looking at it, it seems like there's some stuff, some undocumented features that should help me at least, for example, get like soft decoding information. So I think I can probably get like a per symbol signal to noise ratio and feed that into um, a soft decoding algorithm. If you wanted to have some very small, very lightweight transmit only data nodes, uh, mm -hmm. say for like a, an APRS sort of uh, uh, operation, um, how minimal could you go? Could you use some of the commodity stuff like the, Laura, the Adafruit uh, LoRa feathers or do you need more processing even on the transmit only side? Um, I think, okay, so I mean, at least messing around with Reed Solomon Baturbi the processing requirements aren't, are, it, it encodes pretty quickly. So you wouldn't need a ton of processing power for that. I mean, there's some memory requirements that become kind of tricky. The, I mean, one kind of, a, again, kind of, if I had lots of, like had five of me and lots of time would be to try to port this to an ESP32 um, with the goal of say running on a TT beam. Because the TT beam has an ESP32, it has a LoRa module on it and running at stock power. So it should at least be possible to do it as a data only node. I mean, ESP32 doesn't really have good ADCs or DACs. So if you want to do audio with that, you'd have to add like an I squared S chip on there. But yeah, I think it should be possible to port it to that. It's just I'm kind of right now, I'm mildly vendor locked to. Um, ARM microcontrollers because I'm using embed OS. I would have to port it over to FreeRTOS, which is not terribly hard, but I need, it's just something, it's extra work and I need to just get a, a proof of concept going. Any other questions? Well, great. Thank you very much, Dan. That was very yeah, thank interesting. Thank you. And we ended at 11.30 with 20 seconds to spare. So um, <laughs> I was kind of expecting we were going to run over a little bit. And uh, it all worked out just perfectly. So 